Hello and welcome. This video is on how to use the application we will be developing. It is also about how the user form works. I will attempt explaining why certain functionalities were added to the application. Please keep in mind that these are the same functionalities we will code in later videos. You are looking at a clean form. No record has been added and hence there is no data to export. Now let's add a new record. The risk identification date defaults to the current date of the computer and it can be changed to the date the risk was first realized if it's not the same as the current date of the computer. Remember, we can keep our hands on the keyboard by using the tab order or the keyboard shortcuts. If we are not satisfied with the entries and want to clear all the fields, we can use the reset button or the key combination Alt R. We are prompted of the effect of this action. If the intent is not to reset, choose No. Clicking on the close icon at the top right corner prompts us of exiting the application while in the process of entering a new record. If we had not initiated a new record, this action would have closed the form without prompting. Click No to avoid exiting the application. Now click on Add to Tracker button or use the keyboard shortcut Alt A to add this record to the database. A message that fields marked with asterisks are required pops up. Clicking OK gladly takes us to the first instance of where we must fill out. Provide a staff name and click Add to Tracker. Pay attention to the View and Count Statistics sections of the form. Currently, there are no records to view and all our count fields read zero. We will accept to add the record to the database, so we will choose Yes. We have successfully added a new record. The View and the Count Statistics automatically update to capture the added record. We now have one record in our database. Let's add some more records. So far, we have seen some prompts that help us with unintended actions like accidentally closing the form while entering a new record. And a new record can be added only when all the required fields are validly entered. The next data validation to demonstrate is the restriction on the dates. While the identification date is required, the resolution date is not. Users are allowed to type in the resolution date if they don't want to select from the drop-down list provided. This means we need to make sure we have a valid date. With all the required fields entered, put an invalid resolution date and click on Add to Tracker. A message pops up that the application does not recognize the date as valid. Try guessing what will happen if the resolution date is before the identification date. It does not make sense to say a risk was resolved on a date prior to its identification. And the application helps us to prevent such mistake. Also, a record with open status cannot have a resolution date. Thus, we only think about resolution date when an issue gets resolved. Since we are using combo boxes with predefined list for the date, what do you think can go wrong? Error in dating can occur because nothing prevents the user from setting identification date for instance to say 31st June or 31st September. These months have just 30 days. We put a check on the date to prevent such records from being added to the database. Another date validation is that we cannot have future dates. If we select a date after the current date of the computer and attempt to add such a record, we should not be allowed. Earlier, 
When adding a new record, you might have seen that the risk classification and risk level test fields auto-populate based on risk type. The risk type field itself depends on other fields. It gets its drop-down list based on the values in product type and risk category. We will know in later videos how to code this dependency behavior between fields. With data validation discussed, let's now look at how to export the historical records. Click on Export All Data and choose Yes to proceed. The output is saved in a folder called Tracker Output in the same directory as the Excel workbook. This folder gets created if it does not already exist. You can see that the file or the workbook is named with the timestamp the data was exported. In the View section of the form, the user can apply filters to the records. The filter bar has two combo boxes. The content of the first is found in the second. For instance, if we want to filter by staff name, we select staff name from the first. The second combo box then shows the available staff names. When we select a staff name from the list, notice the count statistics dynamically respond to the filters. If we filter by risk category, the second combo box displays available risk categories. We can apply the date filters and see what happens. If our applied filters provide no records, there will be nothing to view and the count statistics will all be zero. However, we cannot enter edit mode when there is no record displayed. Can you guess why this is the case? To read it, there must be something and we must see what we are editing. Now let's demonstrate editing an existing record. We check the edit mode in the view section to indicate our desire to edit a record. A highlighted record in the view section is automatically displayed in the data entry section for editing. We can click a new record or use the top and down arrow keys on our keyboard to select a different record. There are some edit mode indicators. The form title changes to read Risk Management Tracker in Editing Mode, and a highlighted in Editing Mode test is displayed in the middle left corner of the form. If we want more edit mode indicators, realize that the Add to Tracker button is now captioned Update Record, and the Reset button is now Restore. While in edit mode, all the data validations and form closing warning discussed earlier are applicable. We can make changes to the record we want to edit. If we are not satisfied with the changes we've made and want to go back to the previous information, we just click the restore button. A record gets updated only when valid changes have been made. A prompt is displayed when we attempt updating record with no changes made. This functionality is necessary for the user to be sure if changes have been applied prior to updating. Let's change the status of this record from open to resolved and then click update record. It's nice to be informed to provide a resolution date. Click no and provide a resolution date. Click Update Record. We have successfully updated this record. While in editing mode, we can apply filters. This is useful if we have many records displayed and we want to find a specific record to edit. The only caution is, in editing mode, the application ignores any filters that yield no record. The reason is the same as before. We can't edit nothing, and to edit, there must be something. We don't have any record in the date range specified, and yet we see some records displayed. Suppose we were in the middle of entering a new record 
and for some reason, re-enter the edit mode. Though a record becomes available for editing, we get the previous information back when we leave the edit mode. This functionality isolates the edit mode from other new record mode. This means, while entering a new record, we can always decide to update an existing record and not retype the new record all over again. So far, we have not looked at the Severity Change Tracker, a companion to this form. Before we do, let's see how a risk can have its severity escalated or de-escalated. To do this, we need to be in edit mode. When we select a different risk severity, hidden fields appear asking for date and approval. These hidden fields show up only when there is a modification to the severity of an existing record. If this is just to correct a previous record we did not correctly specify its severity, we can just proceed to click Update Record. However, if we intend escalating or de-escalating the severity, then we must say so by clicking Approve Change. Now, we can click Update Record to save the changes. For demonstration purposes, of which we will see momentarily, we will change the severity of this same record three times. If we just want count statistics on records with a history of severity change, we select Changed Severity from the Filter by drop-down list. In our case, we only have one record with a history of severity change. While in edit mode, if a highlighted record has a changed severity, the severity history button is enabled and the font color becomes red. We will shortly see what happens when this button gets clicked. Now that we have a record with severity history highlighted, we will try changing the severity from the data entry area. We should see that the approved change is checked and disabled. This means once a record has an escalated or de-escalated severity, any changes made to that severity is automatically considered as a new severity escalation or de-escalation and not as a correction of a previous error. If we want to correct a change severity, we will need to do so using the severity change companion form. If we have a record with severity change highlighted, we can click the Enabled Severity History button to know more about the change. We get to know when the change occurred and from what level of severity. The first, previous, next, and last labels at the top of the form are for navigations. They are useful if we have a lot of history to explore. To read it, check Make Editable. This record has three severity changes. If for some reason we want to nullify a change, we just make sure the change to is the same as the change from and apply the updates. The changes have been applied and such a history will not show the next time we view that record's risk severity change history. This is the record we just modified its severity history. We nullified one of the history and so we should have two valid changes instead of three. I hope you are now familiar with different aspects of the form and how they work together to produce the expected result. Watch this video again if you must. The areas we have just discussed will guide us in developing the application. In subsequent videos, I will go through how to set up the worksheets as database tables, the programming or back-end names, and also demonstrate designing the front-end part of the form.